Okay, let's turn back uh, for a little while tonight to Romans chapter, uh, Romans, sorry, Proverbs uh, chapter 9. I was just checking you were awake. Uh, Proverbs chapter 9, and uh, the, we're really going to focus uh, at, at some point in the sermon on uh, the, the latter few verses from verse 13. But Corey finished his uh, sermon last uh, Sunday evening when we introduced the theme of uh, Proverbs and, and what's in Proverbs uh, with the question, how then should we live? And that's really in many ways, what the book of Proverbs is about. It speaks about uh, the way that we live. Uh, that is core in everything. Uh, because it sets out, as, as Corey looked at last week, it sets out wisdom and uh, God's wisdom for life and for living. And in so doing, points us to the only one who is uh, wisdom personified or the way Uh, and uh, who is truth, and who is the Word, and who reveals to us not only perfection, but also salvation, uh, in order that we can be empowered to live His way. So really, I'm just following up what Corey started last week, and it's a second uh, introductory sermon, really, uh, in many ways. Because Proverbs is a book that it portrays contrasts all the time. So it's a book of... uh, uh, relentless contrasts, uh, the way of life, which is the way of wisdom, and the way of death, which is the way of foolishness. It's very simple. And I just want to remind ourselves, uh, as we look at this passage tonight, who we are as Christians, and, and what we were as Christians, and how that changes everything, and how it changes uh, the way we live. And we, I think you'll find... This is the, it's a difficult study because we're not going through uh, each chapter of the book. We're not following the book through it. We're kind of thematically looking. It's, the, you have to look at Proverbs that way. You have to kind of deal with themes. Uh, so, uh, but you will find, and it, it's a great book to take and learn a verse every day. If you learn a verse from Proverbs every day, as a Christian, you're molding your conscience and your life and your thinking uh, towards Jesus Christ and towards His wisdom for us. Uh, it's, uh, in other words, a really, it's a searingly relevant book, uh, and, and you, can, you, can, you can take it with you uh, when you step out into the world tomorrow uh, and into our lives tomorrow and out of the house tomorrow. And by way of introduction, I want to speak about uh, something again that Corey mentioned last week. Uh, to remind ourselves who we are, okay? Who we are as Christians. Because we are children, uh, we are children of the King. That's who we are. If you were here last week, you'll recall that uh, it was explained to us that Proverbs, uh, in all probability, was written for young boys, uh, young men, uh, in royal, ne- uh, ancient Near East royal household. And uh, this is written by Solomon, the uh, man uh, with the king with the greatest God-given unparalleled wisdom of all times. And this book was, was then uh, a, a handbook, uh, a book that uh, these young princes uh, were given to learn how to live. Uh, my son, it says uh, right through the book, and it gives that piece of advice. And I wonder, as Corey was speaking about that and uh, was explaining that, whether you thought, well, I'm not sure how relevant that is for me. Uh, not sure how relevant that will be for my own life. Uh, the wisdom of, of how to live in an ancient Near Eastern palace. Uh, a young boy, young man. Well, I think the reality is that we, we need to recognize two things within that. The first being that this advice given by Solomon is embraced in the Scripture. So it's embraced as part of God's Word. And uh, I think that's significant. Um, In chapter 8 and verse 4, Solomon says, To you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man, children of mankind, to all mankind, in other words. So even within this, it is broadened not just to uh, that uh, a particular uh, group of young people, but to all humanity. And we recognize that really what we have here is, is God's insight, 
God's common sense. I, I would call Proverbs, if you call it anything, I would just call it God's book of common sense or the book of God's common sense. You know, as we seek to live our lives, we find in this His wisdom for our, our living. So it's embraced in Scripture, therefore, as this wider application for us. But also, in a more spiritual application, if you want, broadening it, we are also children of the King. Okay? Uh, we're, we're the children of, of Solomon's greater son, of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who is the King of kings. The greater one than Solomon is here. And we are reminded of that. And we are people as Christians who have been adopted into his family and who have that great privilege. We're indwelt by his spirit. We're heirs of his salvation. We are divine royalty at that level. We have that huge uh, privilege and significance of being children of the king. And so this amazing book reminds us of how we then should live. Not in order to earn our favor, with God or make us right with God, as you well know, but because we've been made right by the King of Kings, by Christ, who is the righteous one. We are alive. Uh, We are under His Lordship. He has given us His Spirit by which we can live, and it's His intention that we are responsible to live His way in His joy and with His common sense because it is the way of blessing and goodness. So Proverbs provides us with uh, two ways to live, really. That practically is what Proverbs is all about. And so you will find that tomorrow, uh, today, tonight, whenever, you will always have choices to make. You will be making choices every day, at every level. And these choices that you make, in God's eyes, will either be wise or we'll be foolish, as he sees us and he looks at us. And every choice we make on a daily basis has a consequence, spiritual consequence in our lives. And uh, what we recognize, uh, and what Proverbs helps us, I hope, to recognize, is to grasp the constant need we have of the redeeming grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to rescue, equip, and help us to make good choices daily. So when we shrug our shoulders and say, well, I don't really need contact with God today. I'm not sure that I need to open His Word. I I feel no desire or uh, real need to pray. Then we are failing to recognize the constant choices that we make and the wisdom we need to make these choices. His way brings blessing into our life and into our thinking. And He wants us, because He loves us, to avoid folly, foolishness, and sin. Because what Proverbs makes clear is folly isn't only self-destructive, it is destructive of others as well. So the choices we make are, are not only our own and don't simply affect how we live, but also affect the way other people Uh, see us and also uh, relate to us and sometimes uh, are damaged by us. And that's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive to our sinful natures. And so for us often, reading Proverbs is like uh, the rubber hitting the road for us spiritually. It's where we really put into practice, as it were, grace and favor. So chapter 9 that we read, Corey read for us, And I'm not really going to look at the first section, which is about wisdom, but I just wanted it to be read because you you have a strong contrast there between wisdom and uh, foolishness and folly. And and Corey spoke about wisdom last week. But we see in chapter 9 that wisdom and folly, or these two ways, they continue uh, to be personified. Okay? So we we have the, the concept of wisdom and the concept of folly, and they are personified as women in this chapter. And we see that Proverbs is a tremendous book as it employs our imagination and reminds us, as Corey was praying indeed earlier, of God's great creativity beyond our capacity to understand. But He gifts us with our imagination to think about wisdom and foolishness, folly and wisdom, in this personification. So you've got wisdom and folly 
uh, as personified as women calling out to attract uh, people to their lifestyle, to their way of living. It's a, it's a, a marvelously imaginative uh, chapter. And it's important for us to recognize uh, that God uses uh, all of our different capacities and intelligences and imaginations to try and bring home his truths to us, and so should we. So how then should we live? Well, we should live uh, in two ways. We should get wisdom, and we should understand foolishness and avoid it. And that's really the simple message uh, from this evening. In Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 5, uh, and again, this is it's thematic throughout the book of Proverbs, uh, get wisdom, get insight, do not forget, and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Get insight, get wisdom. And that's the great uh, cry of Proverbs, uh, as it was last week's theme. And supremely, we see and know that that is channeled through our relationship with Jesus Christ. It is his gift for us. And uh, as we recognize the choices we make each day, we recognize our need for his wisdom. Don't leave your relationship with Jesus Christ in the church on a Sunday evening and pick it up at the door on a Sunday morning when you come back the next week. Don't leave his uh, relationship with you on the shelf during your week, but be someone who recognizes the ongoing need for grace and wisdom. And if you lack wisdom, as each of us do, then let's not be afraid to ask God for his wisdom, who gives generously without finding fault, as he says in James 1 verse 5. So we can ask for this. So as you, as you go to at different stages of your life seeking his wisdom about how you should live, then you find it uh, in relationship with him. But also then, it's important to understand foolishness. And the interesting thing about foolishness is that it's much easier to understand than wisdom, because it's much more inherent within us. It's much more natural. Our sinful tendencies are much more attracted towards foolishness in many ways. But we do need to understand. It. We can recognize it, but I think we need God's help to understand it, to expose it, and to avoid it. I think one of the greatest challenges we have as Christians is to avoid reverting to an old lifestyle, a lifestyle that we employed and enjoyed and lived before we were Christians. I think it's a great challenge uh, for us as Christians to not be naive about temptation, which we'll go on to speak about, and also not to um, grow, uh, uh, not to grow in cynicism about our own inherent goodness. I think it's important that uh, we remain cynical about our own inherent goodness, in other words, our own ability to rely on our own strength without the wisdom and grace of God. So how does Proverbs help us uh, with respect to foolishness and what it says about foolishness? I think in two ways Proverbs does that. First of all, it does it by practically giving us lots of examples of foolishness, of being foolish in God's eyes. And uh, practically, uh, we can learn about God's will through Proverbs, because it's very simple, and it's very clear, and uh, the Proverbs are very sharp and short and easy to understand. And it's revealing, and it's unfolding for us, God's um, revelation of uh, living as a fool. I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in a while. Um, but also, it gives us uh, some, I think in this chapter, particularly in this uh, last few verses, some of the deeper principles that underpin foolishness. Uh, and I think that they are important as well. But it, it does practically tell us a lot of things 
that exposes foolish living. So, we're going to be doing this for a number of weeks, looking through the book of Proverbs. Can I encourage you at some point to take time to go online, uh, open up Bible Gateway or, or one of these uh, online uh, commentary um, concordances, and uh, type in fool or foolishness or folly, and uh, it will give you all the references throughout the whole Bible. We'll click on Proverbs, and it will have uh, 72 or so references to foolishness or folly. Just go through them. Go through all of these references uh, in Proverbs, which explain very simply the references to foolishness uh, from God's eyes. And it gives you a working understanding of what God thinks. You know, we spoke this morning uh, about seeking God's will and knowing God's will. And that's one of our tasks as believers, is to, in an ongoing way, know what He thinks. What does God think about this? What does God think about wisdom? What does He think about foolishness? Well, you'll get lots of references in uh, Proverbs about what God thinks is foolishness, foolish behavior and foolish living and foolish characteristics. It it says things like despising knowledge, not being willing to learn, not uh, uh, taking time to hear what older, maturer people, particularly maybe sometimes our parents, think speaks about a fool being someone who's disruptive in their family, who rejects and despises the advice of their parents, who has an unguarded tongue, who is full of hate, who's scheming, who's proud, who has a temper that is uncontrollable, big mouths, who choose to have bad company, uh, who mock and are indisciplined, who gossip, who are gluttonous and untrustworthy, and who don't learn from their mistakes, and so on and so on. So it's very practical. And Proverbs give us very, gives us very practical advice about the kind of things we should do and not do as Christians. I think sometimes we're a bit stupid about our Christianity, and we, we, uh, we want God to tell us more than He, he does. And yet He gives us so much clear and uh, unmistakable, grace-filled teaching on how practically we should live. So, it does give us practical insights into folly, but I think it also gives us the deeper principles behind folly, foolishness, that lie behind these practical outworkings in our lives. To live like a fool, the, the, uh, the philosophy of life that we have that makes us act in these ways, so it's the one step deeper beyond simply the outward actions that manifest a deeper attitude of mind. And can I say there, look at this uh, few verses here in Proverbs chapter 9. The woman folly is loud. This is the personification of foolishness, and she is inviting people to uh, come into her stable, come into her home, uh, and follow her. She, she is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling those who pass by who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. Uh, To him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. So there's three things, three brief things here we see that um, are the deeper principles of folly that are exposed uh, throughout Proverbs. The first is verse 16. The first principle of folly and foolishness is a lack of judgment. Just a lacking judgment. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says. Now, it's not speaking here about intelligence. It's not speaking here about our brain power. It's this whole idea of being uh, insensitive to learning from God. It's lacking, ju- lacking sense, the sense to learn from God. It's the whole idea of, and you'll see that throughout Proverbs, the fool is someone who chooses to reject wisdom and reject God's revelation and reject God's revelation of their own heart and of their own need. In other words, uh, the fool is someone who doesn't know themselves who really don't know themselves, who will not look uh, in the mirror of Scripture and who will not accept what Scripture exposes and reveals about their need, their spiritual condition, and their need for the brokenness to be healed 
and to be in relationship with the living God. So there's that great deep-seated spiritual ignorance where they, instead of taking God's verdict of their need and of their hearts, they judge themselves favorably. They just look at themselves and think they're fine, and they, they lack judgment to recognize what needs to change in their lives. They proudly tell And we, I include myself, uh, when we're like this, we proudly tell God that we know better. It's a simplistic way of living, and it's a rejection of His revealed knowledge, which is given to us because as our Maker, He knows. He knows the intricacies of our hearts. He knows why we act in certain ways publicly, and He exposes our great need. And so the fool is someone who lacks judgment in that they're not willing to uh, accept their brokenness, not willing to accept uh, God's uh, diagnosis of their condition, of their need, and they're not willing to learn and come under uh, the Spirit's guidance as to who they are and uh, what they must do. So the fool lacks judgment, and that brings difficulties and problems into our lives as we fail to acknowledge God's own uh, diagnosis and remedy uh, of our need. And, and you see that sometimes uh, when uh, people just mock, uh, children maybe, mock uh, the faith of their parents and deny it and say it's just old-fashioned and rubbish and they rebel against their Christian upbringing completely and go against it and go out of their way to reject everything that they were taught and that they were brought up to know and love and become a great heartache and a great source of pain to their parents, their mothers, and to their fathers. And Proverbs speaks uh, a lot about that, that whole kind of rebellion. You reject oh, the, the nonsense that you were taught as you were brought up in church and uh, in, in, in your home. Uh, and there's that deep-seated rebellion that ultimately is a rebellion against God. Uh, God says that's foolishness. It may be cool, but it's foolishness in God's eyes, not recognizing the need uh, for Him, lacking judgment. That's the first thing. The second thing is sensuality. Uh, A lack of judgment... The second thing is sensuality. In verse 17, uh, she says to him, in that sense, uh, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. I think this is a critical uh, exposition of the source and the foundation of foolishness. It's a recognition of the power of temptation and the beauty there can be in living without God and without His wisdom. It's a recognition that there's much about life that can be sweet uh, and can be pleasant, but it's stolen. It's not from God, and there's no recognition of God within that. Uh, Life uh, is enjoyable how, how often have you heard that life is so enjoyable without the burden of church and of God and of guilt and of all that he brings into it and just being content. Foolishness is being content with, the, with life that is stolen. In other words, taking all the good gifts of God and all the pleasures of God and just taking them, but throwing God out of the picture altogether. And that's sweet and that is pleasant and that there's a satisfaction and a self-indulgent there uh, that is attractive to us, but is the way of foolishness. But we see that, don't we, all the time, and we see it in our own hearts. I think we're ludicrously unrealistic and naive if we think temptation isn't sweet and pleasant. If we don't think that there's temptation to be had in the things of this world without God, Otherwise, it wouldn't be temptation, would it? And yet we find what we find is the fool is someone who swallows that hook, line, and sinker and ignores God and says, well, I'm just going to live for today. 
I'm going to take all that God has given me, all the water of life that he's given me, and I'm going to drench, slake my thirst to the full, but without any reference to him. Because stolen water is sweet. And being self-indulgent, in other words, taking that bread that is stolen, uh, or taking that bread that's eaten in secret that nobody else can have, being self-indulgent, that is pleasant. That, that, that is attractive to our sinful uh, natures. So living out our own ideals, living for our own desires, living for fun, living just to choose life, uh, and choose life any way we want to live without spiritual accountability, without reference to God, and the straitjacket that God is, uh, that living and let, letting others live even, enjoying being in control, making our own choices, that's sweet and pleasant and enjoyable to us in life. But yet, to give in to that and to live for that reason alone is foolishness, and it lacks judgment because it fails to see that it's stolen and it fails to see uh, that it is uh, secret. Uh, Sin is always going to be sweet and tempting and easy. And as Christians, if we choose to go down that road because somehow we feel it's better fun than being a Christian, or since I've become a Christian, there's nothing but battles, and the way of unbelief seems to be full of sweetness and pleasantness. And if we don't recognize God within that, and the reality of uh, living uh, in relationship with God, then we are choosing the path of foolishness, folly, not wisdom. So I think in our society materialism, materialistic living, the first world, I think it's turned people's heads and hearts to a great deal, to a great degree, so that there's a great deal of folly in the philosophical uh, thinking and underpinning and foundations that people have, a stealing of, of glory, a rejecting of the giver. It is ultimately, it is a selfish and a shallow way of living. And it's foolishness because it's mere sensuality. It's living as if all we are is sensual beings. All we need to do is have our appetites uh, met and our thirst slaked. Not recognizing that God is the great giver and that we are body and soul, that we, these things are great and good as we recognize the giver and as we use them wisely uh, the way the giver seeks and wants us to use them. So folly, folly is sensuality. If you're living simply to satisfy your appetites, uh, living because it feels good. How many people use that as the philosophy of their life today? It just feel, If it feels good, if it feels right. Living for pleasure, living for satisfaction, living for um, uh, sweetness and pleasantness without recognizing where these things come from and why we have been given them. So sensuality and a lack of judgment. And uh, I think linked into that, the fool is someone uh, in God's eyes who does these things, but also who ignores the shadowlands, who ignores the shadowlands. Uh, But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depth of Sheol. Uh, The dead are those in the shadows, the ghosts. And I think that's a very powerful recognition of um, how God uh, describes and exposes the folly of of living without Him, because there's there's not there's no recognition and no acknowledgement of spiritual deadness when we live without Him. There's no recognition of of judgment uh, that goes along with that, uh, and so. That great reality uh, will always underpin our, the, w- the choices we make. If we understand that we are more than sensual beings, if we know that uh, without Him we lack discernment and insight, and also if we recognize that living without Him is to live in the dark, and it's to live in the, in the dead places, it's to live uh, in unbelief and in danger. 
And so the, the, we are influenced by the choices we make and by who we listen to. We either listen to God in these things, or we listen to our own hearts and conscience or the world around us. Uh, and uh, the appetites that we feed, the company we choose, the philosophies we imbibe, all reflect where we are spiritually and whether we are thinking with the wisdom of God or acting foolishly. And you are all asked, and we are all asked to be discerning. We are all asked to make uh, judgments in life and decisions in life that don't, uh, that uh, are not lacking in discernment, that we are to be people who see who we are before God in the middle of Scripture and who recognize His verdict on death and sin and its destructive power, however tasty, however pleasant, however sweet it is for us in our lives, and however much we struggle sometimes with the Christian way, we recognize that His glorious love and His gift of life is the way of wisdom. Wisdom is to value and benefit from knowing Him and knowing His people and living under His Word and His wisdom within the community of grace. So I think uh, Proverbs is a great book, and it's a great book because we are a people who make choices every day. You will make many choices tomorrow, and so will I. And they will reflect our understanding of God as our King. They will reflect His Lordship. They will reflect whether we follow His way of wisdom, which is the way of life, or whether we uh, follow very often our sinful inclinations, which are folly. Pleasant and sweet, though they may be, they are folly. And uh, I think it's good to remind ourselves uh, that we belong to a royal community, and there are two ways to live, but there is only one way of life. And so Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, who are you walking with? And that's the question I would leave for all of us tonight. Who is it that we're walking with? Are we walking with lady wisdom, or are we walking with the woman folly? And these questions have eternal consequences for us and are hugely significant. Let's uh, pray and ask God to bless His Word. Lord God, help us to understand your truth and understand your way. Help us to know this is not moralistic teaching, that it's not about uh, outwardly living and doing certain things um, that might appear right or wrong, but it does come down to a much deeper uh, understanding of who we are, the insight that God gives us, the wisdom to know our need and to understand and listen to his voice. Choose wisdom, he says. And to understand that we are not merely physical beings, not merely sensual, but we are those who take our sensuality and give it to Christ and are governed by Christ in it, for that is the way of life. And Lord, remind us uh, where life is and where death is, where light is and where darkness is. And uh, may we be aware of the subtleties of temptation and the great insight of Satan and darkness and the evil one to hook into uh, our sinful inclinations, which we find are so easily drawn aside uh, from the way of wisdom. Lord, give us security in your truth, and uh, as we stand on you as our rock, may we find that we are not uh, crumbling, and that when the storms and darknesses come, that we stand firm because we know who we are, we know whose we are, and whom we serve. And grant us, Lord, in our foolishness much wisdom and much wisdom to uh, confound even ourselves and others as we seek to live our lives under the laws of love that govern us. 
the laws of your redeeming love, enabling us to love you and love one another. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.